morning. Good morning, Chavra. I don't have any sound here, guys. I can hear you. Uh, now I hear you. Now I don't. We don't hear Mendel, though. That's the thing. Right. I don't hear you, Danny. I don't hear you, Mendel. Okay, you hear me now, though, yeah? Yes, yeah. Now I hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Danny, I don't hear you, Mendel. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, let me turn off the talk <laughs> on YouTube. Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. Let's get started. We have an amazing lineup today. Um, so we're going to be starting with Hilchais Shvisas Yamtiv. Allah is resting on Yamtiv. Just quickly to note, really interesting that in Shas, when you go through the order of Masachis, it goes Shabbos, Eruvin, Psachim, going through the details of those three Yamim Tevim. And then we have Shabbos, Eruvin, Psachim, Shkalim, Yom Sukkah, then Beya. Masachis Beya is where we speak about the Halachis of Yamtiv itself. Here in the Ramam, we went through Shabbos, Eruvin. Yom Kippur, and now we're going to be speaking about Yom Tif. Even before we get to the detailed halachas of Pesach, I don't know why, just want to mention that reason. This is, this is good, okay. relative to what it was yesterday. This is very close on your face. Okay, so let's start with the, let's start with the introduction. Yesh B'chalal and Shtei Meser Mitzvahs, we're going to be having 12 mitzvahs. Six and six. And this is its details. Number one. To rest in the first day of Pesach. Number three. To rest on the seventh day of Pesach. And Number five. Number seven. And Number nine, Lishbois Barish and Shalchagasukois and Shaloy Lasis Pemelacha. Number 11 is Lishbois Bashmini Shalchag to rest in the eighth day of the Yamtiv, referring to Sukkis and Shaloy Lasis Pemelacha, not to do any work. So we just listed six different days where each one of those days we have a positive mitzvah to rest and a negative mitzvah not to do any work. Ubir Mitzvah Elu Prakim Elu. We're going to explain these mitzvahs in the following Prakim just to give an overview of Perak Aleph. We're going to be speaking about. How on Yom Tif, we have all of the same prohibitions like we do on Shabbos with two exclusions. Number one is any malacha that has to do with Eichel Nefesh preparing food. And number two is Hitzah carrying from one domain to another. Halacha Aleph. Perak Aleph, Halacha Aleph. The sheish is Yomim Ha'elu Shasar Nakos Bas Yes Malacha, the six days that the Torah forbid for us from doing work, Shehain that they are. Rishon Ushvi Shal Pesach, which is two, the first and the seventh day of Pesach. Rishon Ushmini Shal Chaga Sukkot, the first and the eighth day of Sukkot, that's four. Biyem Chaga Shavuos is five. And Ubeecha Lachide Shashmini on the first day of the seventh month, which is Rish Hashanah, is six. So Hein and Ikrain Yomim Toivim, they're called good days. Why are they called good days? Because all of these six days are Yemei Simcha. They're days of joy, making these days good. Now, Shvisa is cool on Shavu. Resting in all of them is equal. They are forbidden to do any type of work. Exception number one is doing work that's for the need of eating. Like it says, however, anything that we need to do in order to eat, we are permitted. Anyone who rests from work. On any one of these six days, you fulfilled the positive commandment. It says within them, 
that we are required to learn, to rest. Koloi mar shvus, resting. And v'chol ha'oyse ve'echad mehen malacha she'ena l'tzorech achilad. Anyone who does any type of work that is not needed for eating, which was the only exception we've listed yet. Kagoyin, for example, shebana, they built, a haras, or they destroyed, a arak, or they, they did weaving, the chayet zebayolu, or any other of the 39 malachis. Hare bitol, mitzvah saseh, they uh, nullified a positive commandment, v'avar aloy saseh, and they violated a negative commandment. Shnamar, like it says, kol malachas avodid lisasu. And kol malacha lo ye aseh vahem. Tuk sukim stating the loy saseh of doing work. And what's the punishment? That v'im asa be'idim v'asraf, it was done with witnesses and with warning, then loy ke min ha-terah, you get malchus. So just to state that we've already learned on Shabbos, if a person violates a malacha with Edim and Asra, then the punishment is skila, where you get flogging. On Yom Kippur, we learned yesterday that if it's for the Edim and Asra, then the punishment is Karis. And on Yom Tif, the punishment of Edim and Asra, like we just said, is Malkus, which is just like any other time a person violates something in the Torah. Halacha Gimel. Eloisa said, yeah. Someone who does many of the Aves Malachas on Yom Kippur, on, I'm sorry, on Yom Tif, with one warning, could go in, for example, Shazar, someone planted and they built and they destroyed and they wove all of these four Malachas, Bahasra Achas, with one warning. So, they're only going to get punished once by getting Malchus once. Why? Because chiluk melachis l'shabes, dividing the thirty-nine melachis. That if you violate many melachis at the same time, you're going to get punished many times. Only applies to Shabbos. The ein chiluk melachis liyamtiv. There is no dividing between the thirty-nine melachis on yamtiv. So you can violate. Here we had four or more than four at the same time, and you're only going to get malchus once. Halacha dalit. Call melacha shechayavin aleh b'shabbos. Any melacha that you're chayav on it for Shabbos, you also oisa b'yomtiv. If a person did it on yomtiv, shloy l'tzorech achila without having the need that this melacha didn't have a need for achila for eating, then like it, you get malchus. Chutz. Here comes exception. The the second exception that we have enlisted me hahitza mir shus l'r shus for taking things out from one domain to another. And for kindling a fire. That since it was permitted to carry on Yom Tev for foods, so then it was also permitted to carry even if it's not directly connected to something that you need to eat. And the Fichach, therefore, a lot of carry a child or a sefer or a key from one domain to another. All of these examples are things that are not related to eating. And so too it is permitted to kindle a fire, even though it is not uh, for the need of cooking. However, the other malachis, if there is a need to do this malacha for eating, and we're going to see that we don't, that a person doesn't want to do these malachas before Yom Tev because he's going to lose in flavor, then mutar. Then it is permitted to do on Yom Tev. Again, for example, shechita ba'afia velisha v'kayetzbehen, shechting or baking or kneading or any other malacha, you're allowed to do on Yom Tev. And v'chol she'ein bohen zorich achila, and any other malacha that does not have a need for eating, then usher it's forbidden. Again, for example, ariga, weaving, Siva writing, opinion or building, or anything similar to them. So, to summarize, in Halacha Dalit, we said that Haitsa'a and Havara you can do for anything, and any other Halacha has to be directly connected with Surah Hachila. Halacha Hei. Now, any malacha, even if it's connected to eating, if you were able to do it before Yom Tiv, and there wouldn't be a loss, and there not a lacking in the flavor, then im if you waited to do it until Yom Tiv started, forbid a person to do it on Yom Tiv. Even though there is a need for eating, because you could have done it before Yom Tiv. Now, why did they forbid this? Because they made a decree that if 
a person is going to be allowed to do all balakis connected to eating, even things they were able to do Arab Yamtif, then they're not going to prepare any of their meals before Yamtif, and they're not, they're going to leave everything for Yamtif itself. And then they're not going to have any time to actually celebrate and be joyful on Yamtif. The Balama Asr Dover said, why do they forbid it? Because Gazera is a decree, Shema Yeniak of the Melachish. After last season, the bear of the Yamtiv person is going to leave things he could have done before Yamtiv. And then the Nimsa Yamtiv Kuli Hoylich, Asia says in Melachis. The entire Yamtiv is going to be busy doing those things. The Yamana Mesim Has Yamtiv is going to hold them back from, from being happy on Yamtiv. And the Loy Yele Pnai, Lachavalishtus, is not going to have time to eat and drink. And therefore, anything that you could have done before. Yamtiv itself, that there wouldn't be a loss or diminishing in flavor, you have to do it before Yamtiv. For this reason itself, the rabbis didn't prohibit carrying on Yamtiv itself, even if it's not needed for eating, because now, even though carrying almost everything is are things that a person could have done before Yamtiv and why didn't the rabbis forbid it um, in order for a person to prepare everything before Yamtiv and have more time? Because in order to increase in the joy of Yamtiv, and a person should be able to go and bring everything that they want, and fulfill their, their needs. And a person shouldn't feel like their hands are tied, they can't carry. So to increase in Simchas Yamtiv, they let a person carry anything that they want on Yamtiv. However, any other work that a person was able to do from before Yamtiv, being that they involve, there's, there's a lot more involvement that a person needs to do. So then a person shouldn't do it on Yamtiv. And you can see from, so you see from the Ramam and Halacha Vav that if a person lives in a city where there is an Erev and you could carry that Pashit adds in the Simcha of Shabbos, just like the Chachamim permit a person to do it for the Simcha of Yamtiv. Halacha Zayin, what are examples of Malachis that are connected to eating, but a person could have done them before Yamtiv? Ketza, how? In Ketzrin, we don't, we don't harvest. And Veloy Dosh, and we don't thresh. Veloy Zer, and we don't winnow. Veloy Burin, and we don't separate. Veloy Techenin, and we don't sift. Esachitim, the wheat. And Veloy Miraktin, be Yamtiv. Also, we don't sift on Yamtiv because all of these steps, Shakol, Eliva, Kayyutse, Bahem, after last. So, it's in Mibai Arab. A person was able to do them before Yamtiv. And the Imbakach have, so there's going to be no loss. Veloy Chisar, and no lacking in the flavor had they done these steps before Yamtiv. But the following steps, Salachaches. Aval, however, lashin you can eat, but if you can bake, the shechten and you can shech, the mavashan and you can cook biyamtiv, because sheim asa ilumi ba'erev. If a person were to do this before yamtiv, yesh bekach hefsed a chesrin tam. There's going to be a loss or a diminishing in flavor, because sheim lechem cham a tafshul shabishal hayoyim ki lechem shenefa be'emish. You can't compare bread that's fresh from that day or a tafshul shenisfashul be'emish, a dish that you cook today. To something that you did the day before. So we let you do it on Yantif. And Veloy Basar Shanishkatayim, even meat, you can't compare meat that you shechted on that very day, Kabasar Shanishkat Eme Emesh, like meat that we shechted from yesterday. And anything similar to this, if it's going to cause a diminishing in flavor, you can do it on Yantif himself. And Bechain, similarly, Machshire Oichel Nefesh, Shayesh, Bahen, Chisar, and Inasumi Ba'erev, also, Things that are needed as a hechsher eichel, things that are needed for the preparation of the food, that there's going to be a diminishing in flavor if you do it erev yamtiv, then oisin, oisin be yamtiv, you could do it on yamtiv itself. You're going, for example, shrikas tvalin v'kayyotzebahen, grinding spices or anything similar to that. So even though, again, the spices is not the food itself, it's only machshire eichel, that's also something that we let a person do on yamtiv. Halacha tes. What's that? I understand you're not allowed to grind spices on Yom Tov. Seems like he's saying The Ramam clearly says that we're a lot of ground grind spices because you're going to lose the freshness of the flavor if you do an Erev Yom Tov. Also, it's like I, it's hard to relate. It's shechting meat and eating the meat on the same day. You have refrigeration back then, so you know what I mean. If you had meat and it was you shechted it the day before, it's sitting out. 
Right. That's what it's about. Without refrigeration. Okay, but spices that doesn't apply and still we see it loses the right. flavor. Very good. Halacha test. We're going to be learning now that a person is not allowed to cook and bake on Yom Tif just for the purpose of eating that food in the weekday after Yom Tif. Not allowed to bake or cook on Yom Tif what you're going to eat in the weekday. And they only permitted a person to do malachis that are needed for eating only because you're going to benefit it on Yom Tif itself. But also, what happens if a person did make the food for Yom Tif? Then they had extra you're allowed to eat the extra food on the weekday. You didn't do it with that intention, then it's allowed. Now we're going to speak about examples where if a person, let's say, is cooking a pot and the same amount of work is going to be needed when you're cooking that pot to cook one piece of meat or to cook many pieces of meat, then even if you know from the outset that you're not going to be eating all of this food, being that it doesn't require any more work on your end, the Ramam is going to permit it. Halacha yud. By the way, I don't know. Maybe you're going to say it soon, but that is the reason why you're not allowed to invite a non Jew to your meal on Yom Tov. Oh, very good. Halacha yud. Mimala isha kidera basar. A woman is allowed to fill up a pot of meat. Even though she only needs one piece. And mimali nachtim chavishal mayim. A baker is allowed to fill up a bucket of water and even though the baker only needs one jug example three mamali isha tamar pas a woman's allowed to fill up the entire oven full of bread even though she only needs one loaf why are we, we permit a person to do all of these three examples first of all because when you have a a, a oven that's full of bread then all of the loaves of bread bake better, and the one loaf that you need for Yom Tif will benefit from adding everything in it. And also, a person can salt many pieces at once, even though you don't need all of these pieces for Yom Tif. Again, because the process of salting, once you're doing one of them, to add other, other pieces, it doesn't require more effort from your end. And so to anything similar to this. A person is cooking or baking on Yom in order to eat it on that day. Or if a person invited guests when they didn't come. And now there was leftovers, part of the dish and the bread. So being that you cooked it for Yom Tif itself, you are allowed to eat it the next day. Whether it's a weekday or on Shabbos, as long as a person doesn't make a trick and they say, Oh, I might have guests, let me add more, but they never really intended to have any guests, then you're not allowed to eat that food. That the if a person did make this trick, then Hareza Asr. It's forbidden to eat it about even on Shabbos after Yom Tif. The rabbis made it, gave the halachas to be stricter with someone that makes a trick, even stricter than someone that bakes or cooks on purpose. Halacha yod base. Eir of tafshilin obviously is not a harama. That's right. Obviously, it's not a harama. Halacha yod base. If someone has an animal that's in Sakana, so there's the, the only concern is that the animal might die. You're not allowed to shecht it at Yom Tev. As long as you know that you can do all of the steps of preparing it where you'll be able to eat one kezayit that's roasted during the day. In order that you shouldn't check that Yom Tev, that which you're going to eat only for the weekday. So things are similar that if there's going to be a loss in that item, so as long as you can prepare it and eat part of it on Yom Tev, we let a person to eat it. Because here we clearly see in your base that the intent of preparing this food is not because I want to eat it, it's because my behemoth is Mr. Kenneth. Right, you try to save, save, save the financial loss. Save the financial loss, as long as you'll be able to eat part of it and benefit from it on Yom then we let you uh, prepare that food on Yom Tif itself. You, you, mm. Mm. So she will be able. 
As long as there's the potential for you to actually benefit from it on the end of itself. That's right. Very good. Basically, if it's pushed at the end of the end of it, and you see your animal that's faltering, you can't go chef it right now if there wasn't, wouldn't be enough time to actually cook some of it. That Correct. Would be, all right. That would be just for the fun. Oh, yeah. All right. Halacha yud gimel. The one and only Rebbe Yaakov Shalom. Morning, everybody. All right. You cannot bake and cook on Yom Tov. In order to feed Goyim or your animals, your dogs. So it has to be the Dafka for you. Therefore, it's permitted to invite a goy to share your meal on Shabbos, but not on Yom Tif because you might add more food for him on Yom Tif. However, if a goy comes to a Jewish household on Yom Tif, then he may eat from the food that you had already prepared for your own meal. Okay, halacha yudalek. Behema shechetzya shel kuti vechetzya shel Yisrael muter l'shechata b'yom tev she'yef she'lech l'mimena k'zai ispasar b'loi shechita. On yom tev, it's muter to shechat an animal that is partially owned by a yid and partially owned by a goy. The reason why it's permitted, um, even though the goy is going to benefit, is because it's impossible for the Jew to partake of his portion of this meat without slaughtering it, which would also benefit the goy. Sorry. However, when if when you own um, when there's a dough that is partially owned by a Jew and partially owned by a guy, it's forbidden to bake it because the dough can be divided as opposed to the animal, which obviously but could not be on Shabbos when someone's someone's sick. So Allah is you're allowed to chef an animal in order to prepare food for them. But if you're cooking food for them, you're not allowed to. You're, meaning, if, if, if you chef an animal on Shabbos, there was leftovers of that meat, you're allowed to eat it, even though, because there's no way you, you didn't add anything for it. But when you're cooking food for a chayla, you, even if there's leftovers, you're not allowed to eat it, even though it was made the head there, right? Because of this whole fear of maybe you're going to add to it. The harama or something. You know? But the case of shefting, you, you have to chef it. You can't partially chef it or chef extra. Right. That's, when you have a, a dough, which is partially owned by a, a Jew, it's forbidden to bake it on Yom Tif because the dough can be divided. Okay, so we said that. And this applies, um, sorry, hold on, I lost my place. Oh, B'nei Chayel. So if you have a soldier, um, which is part of a Goyish army, and... He gives flour to a Jew and requests that he bakes the bread for him on Yom Tif. So we say, uh, sorry, I lost my place again. So um, um, if they do not object to giving some of the bread to a baby, it's permitted for him to bake it on Yom Tif because every loaf of bread is fit to be given to a baby. And when the shepherds also ate from the loaves they gave to the dogs, these loaves may be baked on Yom Tif. A person who cooks on Yom Tif for a guy or for an animal, or to keep um, or to keep that food for the weekday should not be given malchus, because if guests come, the cooked food would be fit to serve to them. And if a person prepares food for himself and food remains after a yom tif, he's permitted to give it to a, to a, to, or I'm sorry, if food remains after he finishes eating it, so he's able to give it to a guy or to an animal, because it's something that was right for him and something that he was preparing for himself. Bathing and anointing oneself is considered the general category of eating and drinking, and they are permitted on Yom Tif. 
Whatever is required for your body, you're allowed to do on Yom Tev. Therefore, um, one may heat up water on Yom Tif and wash his hands and feet. However, it's forbidden to wash one's entire body. And it's usur for the entire body because um, as a gzera to prevent a person from using a bathhouse. When water was heated before Shabbos started, one may wash one's entire body with it on Yom Tif, and this was prohibited only on Shabbos. Does that include a shower of today? I don't know, but we'll just let that one slide. Halacha Yud Zayim. Kol Sha'asr B'Shabbos. We pass it, we have to do it part by part. But the pashtas, it's part by part. I mean, uh, is your body ever fully under the water yeah. if you take you a shower? You shower, you wash your whole body. Part by part, it's just, it's just so you soak off your arm and you wash it. You soak the other, like that. The, the rabbi holds that the showers, like on the side, is part by part. Only the showers that are on top, the big showers. Ah. That's considered oh. all the good ones. The, the, wow. The rain. What do you call it? The rain showers. Yeah, that's good to know. That's good to know. I have one of those too. I should not have used that. Ah, We'll have to have the special yumptive shower head that we'll have to reinstall. All things are forbidden on on Shabbos. All the things that are forbidden on Shabbos, whether because they resemble Malacha might lead to, or might lead, or might lead to Malacha, are all placed in the category of shvus and are forbidden on Yom Tif. Unless, unless they are required for the preparation of food or something similar. Or these specific things that we are describing here. Um, and whatever is usher to remove or to, to, to carry on Shabbos is usher to carry on Yom Tif. Um, unless it's for eating or something similar. Whatever is mutter to carry on Shabbos is mutter. Right. And whatever activities may be carried out on Shabbos can be carried on Yom Tif. However, the category of, of Isser that applies on Yom Tif do not apply to the to that which is uh, Shabbos, um, referring yes to Muksa, and Muksa is forbidden on Yom Tif. Muksa uh, is Muksa is forbidden on Yom Tif, but permitted on Shabbos. The rationale is that since the Isser pertaining to Yom Tif are more lenient than those of Shabbos, our sages forbade Muksa. Lest one come to treat Yom Tif Actually, with disrespect. Is more strict on Yom Tif than on Shabbos? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Halacha Yudchas. Ketzad. So, what does this mean? What would be examples? Because we don't want to be Mizalzo on Yom Tif. Yeah. Halacha Yudchas. Ketzad. Tanegulas ha'imedes legadel beitzim. Bishar ha'imed lacharisha. Biyoyna shrevach uperos ha'imdem l'schayra. Kol elu beitzim behan muksa hein v'aser lachol mehan biyom tif. What, what would be examples of these types of muksa that would be usur on Yom Tif is when a chicken sets aside, is check, a chicken is set aside to lay an egg or an ox is set aside to plow or doves in a dovecote or produce is set aside for sale. These and any similar articles are considered to be muksa and may not be eaten on Yom Tif if they are specifically designated for those things and separated. Um, however, they would be um, mutter on Shabbos. What does that mean? A chicken that is not mutter on Shabbos? Is that what you're saying? A chicken that is set aside to lay eggs. And now that chicken on Shabbos would not be considered mutter. So on Shabbos, those things are considered prepared and they don't need to be separated. But just as Muksa is forbidden on Yom Tif, so too an object that first came into existence on Yom Tif is also forbidden. So if there's an egg that was laid on Yom Tif, we'll so that's, there. yeah, obviously. Okay, Yutas. Kol, 
Chol Mechin, the Shabbos, the Chol Mechin, the Yamtiv, I will aid Yamtiv Mechin, the Shabbos, the Shabbos, Mechina, the Yamtiv. Food may be prepared on a weekday for Shabbos, and food may be prepared on a weekday for Yamtiv, but food may not be prepared on a Yamtiv for Shabbos, nor may food be prepared on Shabbos for Yamtiv. Therefore, an egg that was born on Yom Tif after Shabbos is Aser. Yom Tif is after Shabbos. And is an egg laid on Yom, Yom Tif Shabbos is forbidden. Even though Danny, the chicken... When is it your turn? Uh? When is it Danny's turn? I'm getting confused here. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Next character. Okay, okay. <laughs> Therefore, an egg that was laid on Yom Tif that follows Shabbos is forbidden, even though the chicken is set aside to be eaten, since the egg was finished on the previous day and Shabbos would be preparing for Yom Tif. It was, it was finished inside the chicken on Shabbos. Yes, mm. yes. Okay. So the chicken itself was set aside to be eaten, right? And the yet, chicken would be fine on Shabbos. The chicken would be considered not muks on Shabbos. But now that it laid an egg on Yom Tif, since it was already, it, 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 that, that thing is, now, is designated for you to lay eggs, which means on Yom Tif it would not be allowed because it would now have a higher level of muksa that would be chal on Yom Tif. I think so. It seems that the idea is that the egg was prepared on Shabbos for Yom Tov. Yeah. Not allowed to do that. Yeah. So because the fact that it was laid on Yom Tov means that it was prepared on Shabbos. And that's that's what we're talking about right now. The yeah. Chacham answered an egg that was laid on any Yom Tov. And this was a decree, lest one eat an egg laid on, on a Yom Tov that follows Shabbos. Similarly, our Chachamim forbade eating an egg that was laid on any Shabbos, lest one eat an egg laid on a Shabbos that follows a Yom Tov. All right, that's a little confusing to me, but chaf, we gotta keep going. Shem she asr lachla, kach asr la tautala, vafil nis arba ba'elef. Kulan asura shein lamachar, yutru. Okay, just as, just as it is asr to partake of this egg, so too it's forbidden to carry it. Even if it becomes mixed with a thousand other eggs, they are all forbidden. Why? Okay, we're gonna see. Um, they will all, even though tomorrow they'll all be permitted and the existence of any forbidden article since they will be mutter tomorrow and the existence of any article that will ultimately become permitted is never considered inconsequential. So it's, it's a davar, uh, not, not just only davar shesh matirin, but it's a davar chashuv. Since it's a davar chashuv and that means it can never be bottle. So therefore, no, it, the reason it, why it's not bottle is because they're all gonna be fine the next day. Right. Because they're gonna be fine the next day, so therefore, we don't give you the head of that, oh, it was bottle, so now you could have Right, but I'm, but I'm saying, That's he's why. saying here that it's permitted, since it will become permitted, therefore it's not considered inconsequential. So that means, I think, because ultimately it's a dover, it's a dover, is what makes it a dover, it, not inconsequential. Not right. It's, it's a dover because, because, because it will be, be because of that, right. And therefore, it will never be bottle. When a person shechs a chicken on Yom Tif, and within that chicken he finds eggs that already have a shell, it's permitted to eat them, for this is not a frequent circumstance. And our Chachamim did not institute gzeris regarding things that did not occur, that were not common. Our, our, um, our celebration of every Yom Tif is for two days in the diaspora, and this is considered a minog because the second day of Yom Tif is only a Yom Tif Sheni Midivrei Soi from who? Midvarim Shnis Hadshu Begalos. And it's something that our rabbis instituted for Galos and the inhabitants of Eretz Yisrael. Um, and people that live in Eretz Yisrael only observe a two-day holiday on Rosh Hashanah. That's the only holiday that they observe two days. Is it a minimal or is it 
So give me a second. That's the number. Yeah. So what's the first line? It says, so the earth's called Yerim Tov, Me'ilu Shayam, Minhagu. Same thing. It's not the same thing. Minhagu and Yerim Tov is not the same thing. I don't know. Oh. When my parents were dating, my father asked my mother if she, how, how Jewish she is. She said, oh, we're very Jewish. We observe two days of Rosh Hashanah. My mm-hmm. father thought she was a fanatic. <laughs> okay. Ain't always, okay. Uh, ah, he says in note 15. Yeah. But originally, because there was a suffix, right? So it was a, certainly a stronger level back then before the calendar was established. Now the calendar is established. There's no real reason to do a second day. Okay. Uh-huh. Well, based on what we used to do when we didn't know was it which day was younger. So first it was with the research and now it's not. Well, the Hilchas Kilish Achelish Mesefer Zed Nivar Iker Minot Zed, Umay Zed Tam Uisin Rish Hashanish Neyam in the whole Makim. So I'll explain in Kilish Achelish the fundamental idea as to why this <laughs> about this custom and the rationale as to why Rosh Hashanah is universally observed with two days. So he'll get more into that in Telchus Kiddush HaKadosh. Allah HaKav Beis, Yom Tov Sheni, the second day of a Yom Tov, Alpha Pishim Adibri Seifim, even though it's a it's a rabbinic uh, uh, law, Kol Dover Sha Asa Barishan Asa Bersheni, whatever is Asa on the first day is Asa on the second day. Kol Machal Yom Tov Sheni, Afil Shal Rosh Hashanah, Bein Dover Shu Mishom Lushvuz, Bein Malacha, Bein Shiatza Chutz Lutchum, Mechin Oisai Makas Mardos, Whatever a person violates on the second day, um, whether it's a prohibition of a shvus or a forbidden labor or going outside the tchum, he is given makas mardos. Um, or he is um, put into cheirem. If he was a student of the Torah, he was not. In lo yia min a tamidim. He's one of the tamidim that you don't that you don't put him in a in a in a band. Interesting. Right, unless he right. Hashem shalishan also a hesped of tainus v'chai b'simcha kach hasheni bein beneim hefresh ella leinian meis bilva. Just it's also to deliver a hesped or to fast on the first day of Yom Tov. So we're obligated to rejoice on that day. So similarly, it applies to the second day of Yom Tov as well. And there's no difference between them except with regard to the care of a, of a uh, dead body. Uh, what does that mean? Yeah. What, is, what does that mean? On the first day of Yom Tov, you should have a guy be involved with, bar- with the burial of a of the body, and on the second day, the activity should be performed by a Jew. That means that everything necessary for the burial may be performed, whether it's making the, I don't know what a beer is, but coffin. the coffin, yeah. okay, or sewing the shrouds, or picking the herbs, or whatever is involved in the process. Um, and with regard to the dead body, the second day of a holiday is considered to be as an ordinary weekday, and this applies even to the second day of Rosh Hashanah. I'm pretty sure we bury people on the second day of Yom Yes, we do. And they'll, and they'll do a Levaya on second day of Yom Tov. Meaning, meaning first day of Yom Tov is much more than the second. Yeah. It's more calmer, yeah. More calmer. Yeah. The two days observed in the diaspora are considered two separate expressions of holiness and are not considered to be a single one long day. Therefore, uh, Therefore, something that was considered muks on the first day or came into, or first came into existence on the first day is mutter on the second day if it was designated for use on that day. Chaya ketzad beit sashenol da brishan teyach abasheni. If if an egg was um, was laid on the first day of Yom Tif, it can be eaten on the second day of Yom Tif. Chaya v'oif shen stoydu brishan teyach abasheni. If you have a uh, um, um, an animal or a bird that was trapped on the first day and maybe eaten on the second day. 
If you have a some type of produce that was attached to the ground on the first day and was separated on that day, then it may be eaten on the second day. Similarly, one may paint one's eyes on the second day, even though one does not feel um, sick. So I guess there was some type of uh, wellness therapy when doing so. When, it, when does this apply? It replies to the second days of Yom Tif observed only outside of Eretz Yisrael. However, the first two days of Rosh Hashanah have one level of Kedusha, and they are considered Kshuvim. They are considered one day of holiness and one long day, except for the, uh, the, treat, the treatment of the mess. However, an egg that was laid on the first day of Rosh Hashanah is usher on the second day. If you have a Shabbos, which is next to Yom Tif, and an egg was laid in one of them, it's usher on the second day of Yom Tif. And even if an egg was laid on the second day of Yom Tif, and that second day is followed by Shabbos, the egg should not be eaten on Shabbos. Okay, who's up? One second, yeah, you don't want to sit here, you got to sit by the camera. Okay. 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 <laughs> Ooh. You got it off? Okay, Tema, can you hear me? All right. Hello, uh, Perik Days. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance. I tried to look over the stuff. It's a little technical, a little challenging. So uh, it's, a, it's a Chabura, Yaakov's uh, hurrying. All right. Okay. Efrat Akshanele Biyamte. A chick that was hatched on Yom Tif. Also, it's also Mipnei Shehu Muksa. It's considered Muksa from this uh, concept that we've just been discussing called Nailaz, right? The Ego Shanei Lebi Yom Tif. So to a cat that was born on Yom Tif. Im Haisi Imayim Edith Achila. If the mother was already set aside and prepared for, uh, to be Gishachtin, so then in that case, the calf would be mutted. Why? It was like prepared with its mother. So, had you shechted the mother before the mother had given birth, because, because it was inside of her, it would be considered mutter. Even though it wasn't born. So, we're making the exception that if it was born from a cow that was gonna be set, that was set aside to be shechted, on Yomte, so then you could have that calf as well. Otherwise, you cannot. Halakha base. What? No. Wait, wait, wait. We're getting there. We're, we're about to get there. Okay. Halakha base. The Hamas, Shiites, the Royas, Chutbat Chum. Animals that were grazing um, outside of the, the 2000 Amis, outside of the Chum. Well, boys, the Linus, Zechach Chum, but they come back. To, to, to sleep inside. Does that matter? You have your barn, your animal goes out to the pasture, past the Tchum Shabbos, and, but then it comes back at night to, to sleep in your, uh, in, your, in your area. So, Hari Elu Muchanam, these are considered prepared. You are allowed to use those and uh, shech them on Yom Tzvah. But if you have the animals that they graze, but they also sleep outside the Tchum, in Bo Yom Tif, they come back on Yom Tif. Ain't shechtin. I say you cannot shech them. Why? If they shein muksa because they are muksa. They ain't das anshia ir aleim. So we see this concept of something being considered muksa on Yom Tif if you didn't have your mind on them. If they weren't set aside or prepared for Yom Tif, then it's muksa. So that's the distinction with the animals. If it comes back to sleep normally, then you would consider that in the category of something that's being prepared. That you you would be able to if it's something that sleeps outside then it's not in the category of something that's prepared and it would be muksa. How much? Do I don't think so. I don't think so. It has this this idea of it being mechend of it being prepared. Okay. Halacha gimel. B'chein behamas kadash shenalid ba mum biyamta. So too, if you had let's say uh, 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 like um, 
an animal for hegdish, like, like a bachor, okay? And it became blemished on Yantif. Normally, what's the halacha of an of a, a animal that's a bachor? You have to give it to the kayan, right? And the kayan has to, has to, to in today's day, where there's no base on Mikdash, you have to give it to the kayan. And then the kayan has to wait till it gets a mum. And once it gets a mum and it's blemished, then he's allowed to partake in it, right? So we're talking about a behemoth's kudshah which was, was it, it, it got blemished on Yantif. So, since from before Yantif, you didn't know that this would become a blemished animal. It was, in your mind, it was set aside until whenever it gets blemished. So, so it's also to shakat on Yantif. Therefore, how would it work? Was when you had a blemished animal, you had to get an, an, a coin that was an expert at at was when you had a blemished animal, you had to get a coin that was an expert at evaluating these blemishes to know if it's a temporary blemish or if it's a permanent blemish. And this idea of, of this, this, this whole uh, uh, exercise of bringing the expert to come look at it, that's Asr on Yamtif. So it's Asr, Lira, it's Mume, Kedashim, Yamtif, Zera, Shema, Yatir, Machacham, Bamuman. Maybe the guys get it, if, if, if you get it evaluated on Yamtif, then maybe, no, if he does permit it, you're going to go and check it. You have a Zalichet, Babi, meaning, so we don't even allow you to get the mum evaluated on Yom Tif, lest you then come to shecht it and because you weren't able to, because it wasn't set aside from before Yom Tif. However, if you got it evaluated before Yom Tif, if he inspected it on Friday, on, on the Erev Yom Tif, he could then give you the psak on Yom Tif, right? Because... Uh, because I, uh huh. No, uh, well, well hmm. I think I think no. I think if it already had a blemish, so then maybe already your mind is on it. So he in, inspected it. So then all that at that point, it's already considered like you know, like oh, I I, I was ready for it to, to be. It's, yeah, it's not like the mum happened on it. I think that's it. Right, okay, because you know that the mum I halacha dalid. Let's just say a, a, a animal was born and it was already blemished. How is that This is considered muchan. If ain't and we don't inspect it on yantiv, however, if he was over this and he went and he got it inspected, so and and, and it was determined that it was a a, a mum, so then he is able to shaft it and and eat it. Similarly, a firstborn animal that fell into a bar, so Isolai Parnasa bin Kaima, he's able to um, sustain it in its place. So you're not you're not supposed to take out the bar from the the the, the bachar from the pit because it would be considered uh, muksa. Shari ene yachal aloisa. You're not allowed to bring bring it up. And they should ene roy l'shchita biyamtiv because it's not roy for shchita. Meaning, this bechor, it fell into the pit. That bechor was not allowed to be eaten, so it wasn't prepared yet for yamtiv. So the fact that it's in the in the pit, you have to keep it there. You just feed it. Zel. Okay. Oishves benai. Conversely, we we have a halacha that you're not allowed to shech an animal and its child on the same day. Okay, so now we have the situation of the cow and its baby or child, whatever, shenafu l'bar. Now you have two, two, cat, two, two cows inside the pit. So, mayla esarisha amenata shachatai ve'inishayichta. You could say, you know what? Now, these two, an- these two animals before Yantif were both in the status of being okay, but only one and not the other. Got it? Because you're not allowed to shech an animal and its offspring on the same day. So now you have them both in the pit. You could take the first one out. Cause, ah, I want to go have that. I want to check this one for Yanta. And then you pull a little harama move. Umarim, now you do what they call subterfuge. Umarim sasheni amenata shechatai. You take up the second one in order to shech it. But shech it as eze mehen sheyesi, you shech whichever one you want. Mishum tsar balachayim hatiru laharim. Meaning before we said we're very strict on harama. This is a case of tsar balachayim. So the Rambam is saying that you could pull a little subterfuge in this case, and you could actually end up taking them both out. So you say, I'm picking up the first one because that's the one I want to chef. And then once it's out, you say, mm, change my mind. I'm going to take the second one. That's what I want. And then, the Hamas Chulishin Aflum and Agag, if you have a regular animal that fell off the roof, and it needs to be examined. 
in order to see if you're allowed to if you're allowed to have it. So I said, Yamtiv, you would be able to shecht it on Yamtiv the Tibadik. Um and then you check it. Maybe it'll be found out that it's kosher. I mean, this is a case where it fell off the roof and you're afraid that it would be rendered, I think, a, 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 a trefa, not a mum. This is like that, that it would be not kosher, right? So let's say it punctured the, the lungs or something like that. So even though there's a good chance that it fell off the roof and now it's going to be a trefa animal, we still say you're allowed to shecht it um, and, and, and then check it after you shecht it because there's a good chance that 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 that, that but there is a chance that it would be kosher, and as, as a result, you're able to. So avozin v'tana goyim v'yayin shabayis hari elim chonim ducks, katzkalas, and chickens and doves, right? That are kept in one's house. If you keep it in your house, that's considered prepared. The einet shichun zimun, and it doesn't need to be specifically uh, uh, designated. Avo yayin shayva. However, when you have doves that are in a dovecot, yayin aliyah. Or 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 uh, 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 doves that are up in the uh, you know you keep it up in the in the attic or up in the in in, in your roof. The tiparsha she kinenu batfichin oibavira or other um, it says uh, birds that nest in in basins. I guess I, I I was reading last night that it was I guess when they built their houses they used to build these type of basins that would be places for the for the birds to hang out. You know like some people they they in their backyard they put these like. Uh, what do you call it, Yaakov? Like the, the things that they to attract the birds, you know, like the uh, something, something cosette. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so um, if you have it in or Hari Elum Muksa. So when these birds are up in their dovecot or in the, in, in the, the basins or on buildings or in the orchards, these are considered Muksa. You have to uh, uh, designate it from before Yomtev. I want to take specifically these ones. And then if you do that, then those you're allowed to take. All right. Halakha vav. Zimein sheikharen ulevanin. Let's say you designate some dark birds and some light birds. Or some black and some white. And suddenly the next day, you see that the white ones are in the place of the dark ones, and the dark ones are placed in the white ones. So, Hari Elu Asurim, you can't have any of them. Why? Because we don't say that they just switched places. What we say is that the white ones left, and the dark ones left, and now these birds that came that are there are actually new birds, and those are not the ones that you designated, and therefore you cannot shech those on Shani Oymer, Shem Oysen, Zimen, Parkubahan, maybe the ones that I, I designated. They, 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 they flew away. The Elu Acherinim. And these are other ones. Chol Suffolk Mukhan Usser. Very interesting. This is like, Raman's being very machmir here that if you have a Suffolk, whether this is the one that you actually prepared, it's Usser. Zman Zimein Shnayim Umatar Shleisha. Let's say you designated two birds. And you come back the next day, you see three. What do we say? Hakol Usser. We don't say that just one new bird joined the two that you designated. No. We say the two that you had are gone, and these are three new ones. However, Zimim B'Tech HaKain, oh, oh, oh. However, Shloisho Matash if you designated three and then you only find two, in that case, he's Mutarim. Why? Because we assume that only one flew off, but the other two are part of the three. Zimim B'Tech HaKain, let's say you appointed it inside the, the dovecot, right? Or inside the nest. I'm sorry, if you doesn't inside the nest, and then when you come the next day, you see it in front of the nest. And if there's no other nest except for these, I'm sorry, and it's not able to fly. Wait, I found them in front of that. Yeah, so he could take them, assuming that they're the only ones in the nest, and they're unable to fly. So both of both. Even though there's another nest that's like around the corner with the Tay Hamisha Amma within the 50 Amit, Hari Avon Mutarm is still Mutar Sha'ina Amadada Medada Ella Kenegi Kinabishabe. Because um, these doves are permitted because it says that doves waddle and they waddle only in a straight line to their nest as opposed to the other one which is on a diagonal. So we're going to assume that that's not the, 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 the nest. In general, I. I I remember we learned in the Gemara that there's this, this uh, measurement of 50 amas that's considered the, the area of a, a that, that, that's, you know, they, they stay in the area. There's all these halachas that come up 
come into play, whether it's, it's within the 50 amas, if it's outside the 50 amas, that's when you have to uh, try and determine whether it's the same one or whether it's not. Okay, halacha zayin. Dogim she bebei vorin, you know that. This is what we're talking about, uh, fish that are in ponds, large ponds. So too, uh, uh, or, or, uh, like, like deer or, 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 these large pens, kol shuhu mechusar tzida, meaning because it requires further trapping, it's it's uh, they are, hmm. huh? It's it's mukshi yinalariza. Actually, I'm in habe mitzuda unitzudeno, because we say come uh, if it's something you have to say come bring a net so that we can catch it, right? So then how is it mukshi? Meaning you have to do a further uh, uh, malacha of trapping, so that's that's what we consider muksa. Uh, and the ain't sunlight of yamta, and you can't trap it on yamta. The inside, however, if you did trap it, lo ye So let's say you have the fish in this pond. You come, you bring a net, you hop the fish out. You're not allowed to use that fish on yamta. Mechosha ain't in circum so that, However, if it doesn't need trapping, how is that muchon? It's considered muchon. It's on ice of yamta. So like imagine you have, I, I, I guess like imagine you have fish in your bathtub. So that would be considered, you know, you could hop the fish out. You don't need to use a net. That would be considered already trapped from before Yomtev and Dezirev. The chayin chaya shekin bapar deis ha-samach ear. Similarly, correct, correct. So if it's a big pen and the deer's in the pen and you have to go run and trap it, that would be not okay. If you have it in a much smaller enclosure right. and you could just hop it, that would be okay. Huh? Yeah, well, I, I, I think fish in a bathtub would be okay. It's just small enough that you would be, it, you could reach in there and cop it. Yeah. All right. Similarly, when you have a chaya, which its home is in an orchard that's next to the city, so you look there, kisha hen ketanem, she ain't a chichen tzida, ain't chichen zimon. So it's it, ah so so it's saying that the, it's small offspring that are not running around since so you have a baby deer right so because it doesn't need to be captured it's not running around so therefore it's considered designated from before yomtiv halacha ches mitsuda is chayev oif is v'dagim she person the er yomtiv traps of of a chaya or birds or fish that were what? She perasam erv yamtiv lo yito mehem yamtiv. You can't take. Uh, ah, you set the trap before yamtiv. You're not allowed to take from them on yamtiv. Elam king yadeshi and said to erv yamtiv. You can only take them if you know for a fact that this animal was trapped before yamtiv. Because it, if it was trapped on yamtiv, then it would be asik. Okay, because then it's not considered muhund. Hasecher uh, amas. If someone makes um, like a dam, so you have water that's flowing, and he puts like a wall to get the water to flow into a little a little basin that he has on on his property there, and then in the morning he comes and he finds fish, it's okay to take those fish. Why? I mean, Meaning you set the trap before yantif, and you're able to assume that the fish uh, uh, came in before yantif, and therefore it's Mukhan to be eaten. Halakha test. Bayat shuhu mali pedis mukhanim the nifchas naitim and mukhanim hapchas. When a, when you have a building that was filled up with, with produce and this produce was, was, yeah, it's designated to be eaten. And what happened was it opened on its own and then like the produce came out. So you'd, you'd be, it says from that you'd, 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 you'd be able to take a, I mean, I'll mukhsim erev yantif, but, Okay, this is talking about if you, if you have fruit that's drying, okay? So fruit that's drying, but there kral, is considered muksa until it's fully dried, and then it would be, uh, uh, okay, then it's edible. So here he's talking about fruit in a shmita year. So shmita year, in general, the produce is considered hefker. Shakol... So all the all the fruits are hefker anyhow. So sharif shayir shayim. So he has to make a certain mark. 
So he has all, imagine you have all the fruit that's hanging out on this rack. Okay, so he has to go, this is a shemitah of produce. It's in the middle of the process of being dried. So he has to, the rabbi would say, you have to make a mark in front of, like say, mark from here to here. And that's the produce that I want to, uh, so from here to here, I'm going to take. And if he doesn't make that mark, then he cannot, and it would be considered muksa. All right. Halacha yud. Kuti shehevi teshura li Yisrael biyante. Okay, let's say a guy brings a gift to a yid on yamtim. Let's just say he brought something, let's say it's apple season, and he brings you some uh, delicious looking uh, Fuji apples or maybe honey crisp. So, or if he brings basically uh, uh, animals that it's very possible that he captured them on that day. They're, they're, they're usher. You're not allowed to have them on Yamtiv. The Yamtiv is a Yasu. And you actually have to wait an extra period of time after Yamtiv of how long it would take in order to harvest those apples in order to, 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 to trap that, um, that bird or that chaya. Afilu hadas, the Kayetzeba, even if he brings you something like hadasim, the Svartim love to smell. You're not allowed to smell it until after Yantip. You have to wait until this period of time. You're going to assume that he did it on Yantip. And he did it specifically for you. He's bringing you these myrtles. So, which is, it's, it's interesting here that this is a guy doing a malacha on Yantip, which is an. And, and we're saying, but you didn't ask him to do it. But that's why there's a kanaf, so that you shouldn't think to be able to tell a guy. Okay. And Very good. The guy owes you with the fish yaka. Because it's kalbe'ini abriyas. People think it's very light. Amir, the nukhli is kalbe'ini abriyas, he's saying. And therefore... Right, 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 right. Okay. The imp... Yeah, yeah there's, there's a lot of halachas about that. Huh? Right, that has to do whether could they have brought it without driving in the car. The fact that they drove in the car, does that... Anyhow. If it's a type of produce that he brings that, that it's connected to the ground. Or it's very clear from looking at what he brought that this isn't fresh produce. You know, you could already see the, the, the leaves are starting to wilt or, or whatever it is, right? That uh, this clearly was not picked on that day. Um, or, or, or it's something that, that was not trapped. That they in heavy if it was brought from within the tchum, mutter, it's, complete, it's, it's, it's fine to use. The im heavy, but it was brought from outside the tchum, how is it? Usher loy, it is usher, ba'ababa shal yisrael, zem chutz la tchum, mutter yisrael acher. And if it was brought from outside of the tchum for one yid, in this case, it's usher to him, but another Jew can partake in it. That's uh, what the Ramah says, I think. Yes. All right, halacha yud aleph. Eitzim shenashu min adekel. Biyantav branches fell off of a palm tree on Yamtav. So Asala Asikon, you're not allowed to then use them for firewood. This is under the same muksa uh, uh, concept that we're discussing called Noilad, right? If Neshem Noilad, as Ramam says, because it's Noilad, Im Nashu, let's say Chatanor, but if it fell directly into your oven, so Marba Alem Eitzim Mukhanim Umasikon. Now you can add additional, uh, additional fuel on top of it and you can light it and in that case um you'll be you'll be you'll able you'll be able to use it if um if 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 somebody began taking a, a pile of straw or or a pile of wood so one should not what is that you shouldn't start using the stack only if he had already started from before Yandam. Why? But they say Muksa, I guess you had put it on the side and, 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 and it's Muksa. The Imahaya had to have 
Shari ain roy Shari zemuchan. If the straw is mixed with thorns, so in this in this case we say it's permitted. Why? Because there's obviously no other use for this, only to use it as as firewood, right? As opposed to the other pile that we're talking about, where maybe you're storing the wood for something else. That's the idea. So you're not, it's not completely clear that that wood was to be used for firewood. I guess that's what he's saying. All right, I'll offer you a Ain't mevakin eitzin misvar shel kairos. It's forbidden to chop wood that has been placed on a pile of beams. If they show muksa, because it is muksa. Beloy min hakairos misvar biyamtef. Nor from a kairos. Let's say you had a beam on your house and it fell down on Shabbat and it broke. You're not allowed to now uh, use that for firewood. But they know that it's considered another. Chain kalim shenishru biyamtef. So too, if you had a uh, a beautiful wooden bowl that broke on Shabbos, and I mean, it broke on Yomtev, and now you can no longer use it for your salad, so you think to yourself, oh, let me use this for, for firewood. In Masikim Behen, you're not allowed to use it for fuel, but they shame Neuler, because this would also be considered Neuler. Avo, Masikim Bekelin Shleimim, Oy Bekelin Shnishrub Meherd Yomtev. However, you are allowed to take, let's say, this whole bowl that didn't break, okay, you could use that as fuel. Or if it had broken from from erev yomtiv, hari hu shari hukhnu lemlechas acheres mit the erev. It was already ah, this is an interesting concept. This is something where he says if you're allowed to already use it from before yomtiv, so you have a wooden bowl. You're allowed to use it. It's not muksa because it's not muksa. The same way you can use it for your salad, you could also decide to change it and use it for fuel, right? So so as long as it was not muksa. For something, then you could then use it for another purpose. Make sense? Okay. Um, wait, where are we up to? Nuts and almonds uh, that you eat from Arab Masikin. You're allowed to, uh, you're allowed to use their shells for for uh, fuel on yamtiv. Ah, what do you say like this? If you ate the almonds or nuts before yamtiv, so then you could take their shells and use it as fuel on yamtiv. If, however, you crack the, the walnut on yamtiv, and now you're what do you call it? Now you can for those shells you are not allowed to use as firewood, right? Because that would be, it's like, it's like it was another, same thing like, like the, 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 the keli that broke on, on Yatta. The yesh, nuschois, sheyesh bohen. There's, there is, there are versions of, of the Gemara that say, she'im acholom e be'erev, e'en masikim e'kapleim, shahari huksu. Ve'em acholom b'yomte, masikim e'pnei she'hein mukhanam al gava oichol. So he says there are some uh, uh, shitas that say that if they were eaten before, before, before Yanta started, so then we still can't use their shells for, for, uh, for fuel. Why? Because they became muksa. If, on the other hand, they were eaten on the Yanta, then they could be used because they were considered designated for use. So what's, what's this? Uh... Aha. So meaning that if Ah, so Dafka, if you ate it on Yom Tif, then the shell... It was considered prepared because you were going to eat the nut itself, and then the shells are also considered to be prepared. Ah, and therefore you go. Okay, very good. Halach Yud Gimel. Kites, Ratay, Harihu Moksa. A fresh cut thorny branch is considered Moksa. Because it's not, uh, it's, it, it can't be used for fuel. The fecal, therefore. Asher Lassay, Kamay Shpush. Put litzlois by basar. I can't get to my head. So therefore, you cannot use it for roasting meat, and same, the same applies in all similar situations. So because you can't use it as fuel, therefore you also can't use it as a spit. Even though I would think that, hey, if it's right, if it's fit, it's used as a, meaning if it's not, it can't be used as fuel. It actually should be used as a spit. I don't know. Anyhow, all right. Halachi yudalid. You could take wood that's placed next to the walls of a sukkah 
and use it for, for fuel. But you can't bring wood out from the field. Even though it was collected from before Yom. However, you could collect, if you're out in the field, you could collect the wood that's lying over there and light it over there. So, um, one can bring the wood that was stored in a Rosh Hashanah, even though it wasn't, even if it was not enclosed for Dira, provided that the fence has a gate and it's located within the Tchum Shabbos. But if it's missing one of these conditions, like it's past the Tchum or there's no gate, or it's not a Rosh Hashanah, so then in that case, Harehain Muksa, it is Muksa. You look at storage house, no, it's Yom Tiv. No, you, you're allowed to carry on Yom Tiv, right? That, that carrying is not the problem. All right, Halacha Tezvav. Um, oof. How many more do I have here? Uh, I'm going to have to switch over, man. I'm struggling here. Okay. Ale Konim va Ale Gafonim. The leaves of reeds and vines, okay? Um... Even though it was collected in one of these uh, karpops, one of these like uh, back lots, since the, the wind spreads it around, it's like, uh, it's like that. It, so if you gather it and the wind spreads, spread, uh, uh, spreads it out, it would be also if you put a heavy uh, vessel on top of it from before Yantav, Hari Mukhanim, that would be considered Mukhund, and you would be able to uh, to use it. Halakha tez zayin, behema she mesa biyamtav, if a behema died on Yantav, im haisa musukhenes, me'er biyamtav, if it was already like uh, uh, sick and it was faltering from before Yantav, Hari zayin, you could cut it up and feed it to the dog. In la, but if not, since he did not have in mind to be able to use it, you can't move it at all. So if you have the sick animal, you can feed it to the dogs once it dies on yuntif. Otherwise, you cannot. If you have a consecrated animal that dies, or truma that became tame on yuntif, you cannot move from its place. It would be considered muksa. Halacha yudzayin dogim va'ifes v'chayesh a muksa. If you have birds or or fowl or wild beasts like deer that are muksa, so ain't mashkin aisev yantiv. You do not give them to drink on yantiv. Ain't aisev l'fame mizenis. You cannot give them food. Shama yavah likmeh. Maybe you'll come and take them. Cholo asha b'chol sh'asul achla aylish tamish boy. Also, the top anything that is that is you're not allowed to eat from it, you're not allowed to use it on Yom Tov because it's muksa. So you're also also to move it in any way. If someone brings in uh, earth um, into his into his domain on Yom Tov, I'm sorry, before Yom Tov, uh, if it was in a in a like a corner, so then it's considered prepared. Then he's able to move it and he's able to use it for all his needs. It's considered a prepared uh, substance, and therefore it's not considered muksa. And similarly, ash, which uh, came, which was already burned up. So it came from fuel on Erev Yantav. That's considered Mukhan. And you could, um, you can use it on your, huh? Yeah. Cold manchu chas today, literally by beta, mutal tatev, shadayan eshu. What does it say? That if it's, if it were, came from fuel that was burned on the Yantav itself, so it's per, permitted for use, what does it say? As long as it's warm enough to cook an egg. 
Why? Shadayin eishu, because then that would be considered in the category of fire. V'yamlav, if not, asalatalpa, it becomes as to move. Eishu noilad, it's noilad. So just to, I, I don't know what they exactly they used uh, ashes for. Maybe we learned that they used it for, to, to clean themselves or, or maybe. Huh? Well, you're not allowed to clean clothes on Yom Tov anyhow, but let, whatever they were, they had use for ash. So we're just making a distinction that if it became ash before Yom Tov, then you could use it on Yom Tov. If it became ash on Yom Tov, so while it's still hot, you can use it for cooking. It's considered like, like fire. If it's no longer hot and you want to use it for something else, it's considered no and it would be muksa. Misha, how like decker not me'erb Yom Tov? If someone has, ooh, a decker no, it's, what is this? This is an iron shaft that's implanted into the ground. And the son of Yom Tov, the hella afar, he pulls it out on Yom Tov and by doing that, he uprooted some earth. So, Im Haya Aisha offer Tichua Harizem Chasabay Matatlai. If the earth is powdery, so then he could use it and use it to cover spills and it could be carried for any purpose. Abu in Hello Gush offer if he uh, raised up like like um, more moist uh, earth. Harizem Loy Yichtoish Aisha Biyantif. Then he is not, it can't be crumbled on Yantif because it's not in a state of being Mukhan, and that is the end of Perek Beis. Yashikayach, guys. I'm going to pass over to David. Okay. Let's go. Push up, guys. Freyla. 14. Freyla. 14. All right. Here we go. Misha Hayen Loi Afar Mukhan, a person who has earth that was prepared. Or a fair shmutzel or you have these ashes that we just spoke about that you are able to move it around. You're able to shecht an animal, and then you can use these uh, earth or ash to be able to cover it. If you don't have earth that has been prepared, or a fair harui If you don't have ashes that is prepared <coughs> or earth that is prepared, you shouldn't shecht the animal. If you transgressed and you did shech the animal, you should not cover the blood until after Yom Tov. If you have a creation that you have a suffolk, if it's a chaya, or if it's a behema, you're not sure. You should not shech it on Yom Tov. If you did shech it, you should not cover the blood until after Yom Tov, even if you had earth or you had ashes that were prepared, maybe you're worried that, that somebody who's going to see, they're going to say, somebody's going to say the animal is categorized as a beast and its blood can be covered on the holiday, which you're not supposed to do. And then, no, no, no. The, I don't think that's right. The I'm not allowed to cover the blood normally. Not on Yom Tov, it says. That not was, for this animal. Not for this animal. No, no. Normally, let's say you have a deer. A deer is a chai, you have to cover the blood. So if you have set aside earth or, or ashes, we said you actually are. Of course, you have to, right? You have to cover the blood on Yom Tov. This is a suffix chai, suffix behemoth. Right. Because and of the suffix chai, suffix behemoth, we're afraid that if someone sees you covering the blood, then they're going to assume that it's a chai, and then they can go eat the, the chai. Right, chayla from a chayla is is is, is, is awesome. water, and chayla from a behema is right, also. Right, right. So because they'll see you covering the blood, they're going to assume that it's a bad chayla, and then they're going to come and eat the chayla, and, and, and then okay. they can be possibly right. Very good. Allah base. Chena sheichet chayla ve'oif me'erev yom tov. A person who shechs a um, beast or a fowl on erev yom tov, lo yechas edama yom tov. He should not cover the blood on yom tov. Shachad behema chayla ve'oif yom tov minis arev damam. If he shechted the animal or the fowl on uh, Yom Tov and their blood became mixed, this chaya or this uh, uh, oif, you should not cover the blood until after Yom Tov. If he had prepared earth or ashes, if you're able to do it with one shovel full, then you can cover both of them on Yom Tov. Right, just to, okay. to be clear, we don't cover the, the blood of a, of a behemoth. We do cover the blood of a chayah. So in this case where the blood's got mixed, yeah. so now 
if you're taking, you're allowed to use the dust to cover, but you're not allowed to do it for a behemoth because that's not blood that requires being covered. So Rambam says, if it comes mixed, you shouldn't do it. Wait till after Yantam. Unless you have enough that in one shovel or you can cover it all. Then you right. just do it. The person who shechs an animal on Yom Tov. He is permitted to pull off the wool by hand and place it where he wishes to slaughter it. Provided he does not remove it from its place. Because rather leaves it's better that he leaves it there tangled with the remainder of the wood on the animal's neck. Ava if however, you're dealing with a chicken, uh, he should not pull out the feathers. Because this is the usual thing that you do. And then that would be considered as toilash on yantif. The person who uh, skins the height of an animal on Yom Tov, lo yim lachenu. He should not salt it. Shaze ibu 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 because this is called part of the leather making process. Venimsa oisa malachas loy litzurich achila. And leather making has nothing to do with achila, so therefore you should not salt the animal, salt the or. Avo noisin lifnei beis adrisa. However, a person is able to put it on a place where the people are going to step on it. Kadei shidrisu alav lo yipasid. In order that he sh- they should step on it, and this piece of leather should not become spoiled. The only reason we made this permissible is because of Simchas Yentev. Uh, so a person shouldn't refrain from slaughtering it. Right? So you're meaning if he's going to lose the leather, he's going to say, I'm not going to check the animal. I'm going to eat vegetables. I'm not going to have Simchas Yentev. Very good. It's a, you're allowed to salt the meat on its sli, on a, a roast, on its hide. The meat that you're going to roast, you could salt it on while it's the while it's on the sli, right? Umarimim bedavazet. Um, we're we're doing haram on this. Ketzad. How do we do it? Meleach meat basar bekan umiat mekan. You salt a little bit here, salt a little bit there. Ad shim lecha ur kulay until the whole entire thing becomes salted. Move the roast over here. Salt. Move yeah. it over here. You salt it until yeah. the whole uh, the Things, whole yeah. eye is covered in salt. Alach kehei. Bamat varmamarim. What are we talking about? Bemaleach litzli shein l'tzarech malach harbe. We're talking about uh, salting on a sli that doesn't have a lot of salt. Ava likdera. However, if you're talking about cooking, asim lech. Or you're not able to salt on the hide. So too, it's forbidden to salt fats. Nor can we flip them. And we're not able to flip them or spread them on the staves of the wind. Because this is not the way that you eat this type of meat. Allah above. A person who skins an animal on a holiday. He should not use this method called regol on Yom Tev. Uh, what does it mean, regol? What does it mean, hamargil? A person removes all the, feet, all the meat from one foot. He makes a hole and he pulls it off of one foot. In order to keep the entire piece of leather intact so that it should become torn. This is like a nice piece of leather you can use. Right? Because this type of tricha that we're doing is a big tricha. It's not something that you have to do to be able to eat the meat. Okay. Okay. The basar, so too it is forbidden to cut a handle into the meat. Meaning, when the handle is made with a knife, therefore you're restricting it in your ordinary matter. You are able, however, to make a simon in the meat. Okay. We can pour hot water over the head or the feet of the animal. And you're able to singe it with fire. We cannot apply lime or clay uh, or a loam for that purpose. 
We cannot trim it with scissors. We cannot pair a vegetable in decorative fashion. However, we can trim food that has thorns. Okay, for example, artichokes or cardinals, you're able to decorate them because that has to do with food. Okay, halacha hey. We're able to need a large amount of dough on Yom Tev. We're also able to need the dough on the day before Yom Tev. We do not take challah on Yom Tev. If you did need it on Yom Tev, you're able to separate the challah and you're able to give it to a coin. If the dough is impure and the chala became impure, you should not bake the chala. You only bake on Yom Tov for that which you're going to eat. And this chala that you're burning is only for the purpose of burning it. You're not actually planning to eat it. This bread is It's coming. You're not... It's going to be Therefore, burned, you but you're not going to be eating it. Okay. So too, we do not burn it on Yom Tov. Because we do not burn sacred food that became impure on Yom Tov. For the burning of Chachim is a mitzvah ase. Like it says, you shall burn it with fire. And you don't uh, do a malacha that's not for the sake of eating. Meaning, and an ase does not push away a loisa ase. Correct. Got it. Okay. Malacha test. A burning that are and on Yom Tov we have an assay and a loisa say. Yeah. An assay doesn't override both of them. Right. Both of them, right. Kitzad Yaseba, how do you do this? How should you deal with Imkir Khala? Yanichena Ada Arab Yisraf Oisa. You leave it until after Yom Tov and then you burn it. Haya Yom Tov Shel Pesach, it was Yom Tov Shel Pesach. Shaim Yanichena Tachmitz, if you're going to leave it, it's going to become Chamitz. Lo Yafri Shaza Khala Batsek. You should not leave Khala uh, from that dough. You should uh, bake the whole thing that's tummy. From there, you're going to take uh, challah from it. So it shouldn't become chametz. Okay, halacha yud. In oifin b'furne chadasha, we do not bake an anew earth in oifin b'furne chadasha, we do not bake an anew earthenware oven on a holiday. Gezer Hashemah tiftach tafsid halechem. It says a decree in you're gonna crack that the oven is gonna crack open, which is gonna spoil the bread. Vimana misim and you're gonna ruin your simchas yomtev. In gorifin tanur bichirayim, we cannot rake out coals of an ash on, on an oven on yomtev. Aval chabsin esa efer shabahen. However, we can press them down. Vim iav shar leifoyis boy oil bitzloyis boy el ala. However, if baking or roasting it is impossible, unless we rake out some of it, then you're allowed to do it. We can seal the oven with tit, with mud, or sediment from a riverbank. Provided that it was made soft on the day before. However, if this mixture of mud is going to become hard on Yom Tov itself, Asur. So too, we're able to mix ashes with water to make a clay-like mixture in order to close off the tunnel so that no air gets into the tunnel. Uh, we cannot apply in a new range or an oven. Yeah. We're not allowed to apply oil to this new range or an oven on Yom Tov. No, can we apply cold water to it in order to seal it? 
chasman. Um, this means we don't rub it with the cloth. Oh, we don't rub it with the cloth, nor do we apply hot, cold water to it to seal it. However, if you're doing this in order to be able to bake, since that's for food, you're allowed to do it. We cannot heat stones with the intent of roasting or baking upon them because this is what seals them. We cannot heat or bake in an earthenware oven. Oh, we are allowed to heat or bake in an earthenware oven and heat water in a cauldron. Okay. We cannot make cheese on Yamtev. Cheese will lose its flavor if it's prepared on the day before Yamtev. Will not lose its flavor before Yamtev. Therefore, you can do it on Yamtev because you could have done it before Yamtev. Could have done it before. Just as good. In contrast, a person can crush spices on Yamtev the way that you normally crush spices. Because they're going to lose their flavor if you do it the day before. Aval melach, however, salt in an idam yentev ella in kain chita hamid amachteish or she yaduch bekarka bekarka vayotzeba. You cannot crush on the holiday unless one tilts the pestle, crushes it in a bowl, or deviates from the normal way. Kadeish yishane. Okay, in order to change it, she im shacha shachak a melach me erev yentev yafuk taima. If you're going to crush it on erev yentev, you're going to lose its flavor. But ain you're not, you're not going to lose its flavor. So you should have done it. Arab oh, you should have done it. Okay. It doesn't lose its flavor. Salt doesn't lose its flavor. Okay. So you should have done it before. If you do it, you have to do it with the sheen. Right. Yeah. If you do it, we may not grind pepper in a pepper mill. Rather, we have to crush it in a pestle like other spices. Allah yud gimel. In kushtin kush. Kreishin as a replace the machteshes gedola. We shouldn't crush groats in a large grinder. Avol kreishin the machteshes ketana. However, you can grind it in a small grinder. She said, "Who has shinoi shela?" Because this would be considered a shinoi. Where is Israel? Filo be biktana asur in Eretz Israel. Even doing it in a small way, which would be considered a shinoi, is not. Because the grains that grow in Eretz Yisrael are, are of a higher quality. If you're going to do it on Erev Yantiv, then you're going uh, to it no lose its flavor and you're not going to, it will not lose its flavor right. because it's a better quality and you're able to do it the day before. Yeah. Flour. Even though it was sifted on the day before the holiday, and you removed its brand, we may not sift it again on the holiday unless a, um, unless a pebble or a sliver of food or the like fell into it. If you made a shinoi, Mutar. This is mutar. Kigayin shirak shiraked macharei ha nafa or shiraked al gabe ha shulchan. If one deviates from the normal way of sifting it with the back of a sifter, sifts it on the table, and so on, chayutsu bishnei bishnei zeh. You're doing some sort of shnei. Okay. Allah ha tesvav. Molalin melilois mifarchin kitniyois biyom teiv. We're able to remove grains from husks. We're able to remove legumes from their pods. We're able to use both hands to do it with all of our power, and then we're able to eat it. Onion to the filu, the cano is, or the sum hui. We can use a tray or a pot of aloy be tava aloy be vara. However, we cannot use a sifter or a strainer. The chen habere kitney is beyond to the person who does. Separation of kidneys. We're able to do it 
in the normal way in his bosom or in a pot of aloy minafa, aloy be tefila, aloy be chvara. However, you cannot use a strainer, a tablet, or a sifter. Halacha tesai. Amadvar marmurin. Okay, we're after seven o'clock. Amadvar marmurin. Kisheha oichel miruba al hapseilas. When there is more food than waste, aval im haisa hapseilas miruba al oichel. However, if the waste is more than the food, bara esa oichel necha hapseilas. You're able to separate out the food and leave the waste. However, more if however more difficulty involved is involved in separating the waste from the food than in separating the food from the waste. Even though the food is more, you can remove the. Remove the food, the food that you want, and you can leave the waste. We do not filter mustard. We do not filter mustard using a filter designated for that purpose, since it seems to be like burr. However, we can mix a raw egg with mustard in a strainer, who mistanen me alav, because it's going to undergo a burr by itself. It's not burr that you're doing by yourself. If a filter was already hanging over the container before the commencement of the holiday, you're able to put filter water through it on yom tov. However, a person cannot hang a filter on the holiday itself. It's not something that you do during the weekday. Myrim, no, oh, just do it the way he does it. The, the way he does it on the weekday. Okay. Marim, he can be have harama. He can hang the filter to hold pomegranates. He can use it for that purpose to um, hold the remaining. Then you're actually really doing it in order to filter the wine. Good job, everybody. Have a great day. Good job. And the end report. No, it ends right away. Everything ends right away. Guys, try. Very good.